thank you everyone for joining us today um, for our webinar, Civil Disobedience Against State-Sponsored Violence and Police Brutality. Uh, my name is Emma Pritchard. I'm one of the coordinators of the International Peace Bureau Youth Network. And um, we have been working uh, with a really great team, my colleague Lucas Worrell, also from the International Peace Bureau Youth Network and treasurer of the International Peace Bureau, Emily Rudino and Molly McGinty, who are from the World Council World Conference Youth Assembly, uh, Maria Tsirantonaki from the International Trade Union Confederation, and Rebecca Irby, who's founder and executive director of the Peace Institute and co-founder of Midheaven Network. Midheaven Network is the network that is broadcasting 10 hours of um, events, music, art, etc., to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima nuclear attack in Japan. Um, so they, um, I wanted to thank them for their hard work putting together this webinar and um, we're all really excited for this excellent panel of uh, speakers who you're going to hear from today. Watching the news lately, we have seen a stream of resistance against governments around the world and many occasions when peaceful protests against police brutality have been met with more and escalating brutality. From the US to Hong Kong, we've seen the same patterns repeating. Global discussions of racism and white supremacy have also caused us to hold up a mirror to our own peace movements and consider our complicity in this system. I'm very glad you could join us to hear from our excellent panel on this much needed discussion and hope you've come prepared with your own questions for a lively discussion. Um, so I'll run you through the format of our event, which is that we will have um, each of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll have a, a guided panel discussion uh, for about 20 minutes and then we'll have about 20 minutes of general discussion. You can ask questions, please make use of the Q&A function on Zoom for those and um, we look forward to your contributions at that point. So um, in order to not be speaking for too long and, and uh, hand over to our um, amazing panel. I'm going to start us off. We have for our first speaker is Anieli Nascimento from Brazil. Uh, Anieli is an, an economist and has a master's degree in population studies and social research. She's a member of the executive board of the Teachers Union of Rio de Janeiro and a member of the Black Women Network in Rio. From 2015 to 2019, Anieli was the deputy secretary for culture at the Central Unica dos Trabalhadores, one of the main trade union national centers in Brazil. She's going to be talking to us about the situation there and her work, and um, I will hand over to her now. Hi, everyone. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here and sharing with you what's going on in Brazil, especially about our human rights, uh, talk about the pandemic crisis here in Brazil. So um, I'm trying to summarize uh, what's going on in 10 minutes, which for, for us, it's, it's almost a miracle, okay? So uh, firstly, I'd, I would like to highlight that coronavirus is a result of a huge environmental imbalance. And if we don't, we don't change, the economic production to a sustainable way, our generation and the future generation will be a victim of uh, many pandemic and catastrophic will impact strongly uh, the poor people. And today we have, uh, unfortunately, we have nearly 98,000 deaths in Brazil. Until Saturday, I think we are gonna have 100,000 deaths in Brazil. Uh, a disease that came from abroad and here in Brazil, most of people who are traveling abroad are middle class or rich people. So to illustrate, here in Rio, the first death was a domestic worker who used it to work in, in a rich area of the city near to, near in front of the beach. Uh, so she, uh, a domestic worker was the first death in Rio de Janeiro. She was working to a rich woman who came uh, from Italy. So it's something strong 
and it illustrates a lot how this disease came to Brazil and how it spreads and, and how it's uh, affecting especially uh, poor people, work, work people. So, but this virus, it's, it's itself, it's not only, it's not the, the, the only respons resp resp responsible for all deaths. Political decisions are crucial to prevent and avoid deaths. Unfortunately, uh, Brazil is paying a high prices. After all, uh, Bolsonaro as president is too dangerous as coronavirus. Bolsonaro, who was infected two weeks ago, he neglected the World Health Organization uh, orientation. He he's always sending strong messages to to population saying that this coronavirus it's not only it's just a flu and we should try chloroquina and uh, during this this pandemic time uh, he has already changed three health ministers so you can feel how unstable is our country and this government bolsonaro is neglecting uh, indigenous health because indigenous they are living in 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 countryside near to forest and they are more vulnerable uh, because they don't have uh, the, the best uh, health care, they, they are more exposed to uh, agriculture and this, this kind of, of uh, vulnerability is uh, a risk for indigenous and Bolsonaro doesn't care testing rates uh, and uh, uh, that's something uh, unbelievable because we are a huge country and we should you sh we, we should be testing more to know how uh, how this uh, virus is uh, spreading in Brazil we don't have these these uh, testing we are not testing a lot like in Germany like in other countries in economic, uh, uh, in our economic situation, I would like to ha highlight uh, about uh, the minimal income to unemployed and informal workers. Um, the government um, gave gave uh, a minimum a minimum income to these vulnerable people, to poor people, but um, only. Um, you know, in 80 million people that should uh, that should get this money, only 40 million have access to this income, uh, this minimum income, which is not which is, it's not enough. People are starving, and people uh, need to get some money. The people really need income because they don't have uh, uh, unemployment, and they are being fired. Uh, by big companies. Um, well, this is uh, uh, summarize. This helps to summarize summarize our our um, our main fight. We are trying to fight to denounce uh, Bolsonaro in international uh, arena. So um, Bolsonaro administration is was filled uh, uh, was denounced at the International Criminal Court in Haya for uh, genocide, because we believe that these uh, almost uh, 100,000 deaths are a result of his neglect position. He's always neglecting the science, always neglecting the, the, the World Health Organization, and um, he's not giving guarantees to our populations to keep alive and to keep health. Well, uh, what about uh, dialogue, social dialogue, freedom uh, of uh, uh, expression? We have a huge problem here because uh, um, Bolsonaro uh, government, uh, it's a copy of uh, Trump administration. So uh, the, the Bolsonaro um, is always trying to block dialogue to, uh, to develop some conflicts. And uh, so he disrespect uh, public opinion, he disrespect journalists and the, he's chasing opponents, he's chasing anti-fascist 
its movement and uh, uh, um, black women movement, you know, and, and something that uh, we are fighting against uh, this, this, this position, this kind of, uh, of a government. Uh, so abuse and repression for of uh, social movements has increased uh, since uh, 2017, as well as the persecution of human uh, rights activists, journalists, as I said before, we are denouncing abroad, we are speaking up, out, uh, and the so social media is a very powerful tool to help us to spread our voices. So we, uh, women, black, black movement, indigenous and environmental movements are dealing with this government that neglects voices and answer with more violence. And uh, um, it's a, one important uh, characteristic of this government is the uh, strong presence of military, military in positions in the government. We have so we have a lot of military people in uh, uh, Bolsonaro government. What, what does it mean in numbers? We have nearly 3,000 military position in the government. It, since the country's, he, since, since the dictatorship in Brazil, which was a military dictatorship, we didn't, we have never seen something like this. So you as a civil, you are voting for a civil government. And then the government decided to put um, 3,000 military to, to deal with a civil, a civil uh, government. For example, our um, our uh, current current um, minister of health minister is a military. He's military, but he's not a doctor. He's not a, an specialist uh, on health. He's a military. What does he's doing there? He doesn't know what to do because he's not a specialist. And uh, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we, uh, Rio de Janeiro is the city where the, the, the Bolsonaro family lives. And uh, their sons, Bolsonaro sons, they are, in, they are politician too. And they are getting uh, investigated on strong relations with paramilitary groups. These paramilitary groups are um, like a, a, a parallel power, a parallel government in poor areas, not only in Rio, but also in others, are investigated uh, for um, killing Marielle Franco, uh, 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 Brazilian, a Brazilian politician who, who was killed uh, two years ago. So you will see a strong relation between both uh, Marielle Franco uh, case. Uh, she was killed in Rio because she was speaking out. She was a voice of the black movement, of human rights movement here in Rio. So uh, I would like to highlight too that uh, we as black people here in Brazil, we are uh, the majority of, uh, of the country, but we are being killed systematically, I mean, we are more is exposed to police violence. Um, some research uh, point out that uh, each 23 minutes, a young black man is murdered. Uh, so it's something uh, unique in the world. Brazil is, is, is a country which has um, the majority of population, we are black uh, and we are deaf. We are the, we're being murdered by the the, by the police, and uh, we need to to join uh, this this cause. And anti-racism is an important um, it's an important movement here in Brazil, and we we are, we want to speak more about it. Well, um, uh, to to finish um, during the pandemic crisis, uh, Bolsonaro also promoted new rules for in favor on deforestation in amazon we i of course uh, all over the world is paying attention to this because brazil used it to be committed to mutual to we brazil used it to be committed 
to uh, international agreement, multilateral agreement. After all, the, 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 the forest, the, the Amazon forest is very important. And we see that some agriculture, agribusiness, uh, they are uh, deforestating to, to produce uh, soybeans, uh, corn, and of course, um, uh, these um, meat, uh, I forgot the word. Okay, okay but uh, that, that's something that is, it's, this impact of this, this deforestation uh, is, is huge, not only for Brazil, but also to the whole world. So um, I'm gonna fi finish now. I think it's just a, a little bit that, that I try to talk a, a little bit of what's going on in Brazil. And if you have any questions, okay, you can send us. Thank you. Thank you, Anneli, and for giving um, a very good rundown of the many, um, many different things going on in Brazil at the moment. Um, and I'm sure we'll pick up on those, more of those in the discussion. Um, I, people, uh, we have people monitoring the question and answer section. So if you have questions as you go, feel free to send them in, and we'll we'll try and get them them during the chat. You don't have to save them to the end. If you have questions now, send them in, and we'll we'll save them for later. Um, we're going to now hear from Hewa, who's um, from Damascus, Syria. She grew up in Kamishli city, um, but fled Syria six years ago and lives in a refugee camp in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, she's traveled to Japan uh, for a summer school in 2018, um, and uh, which gave her the opportunity to meet people from all over the world. We're really, really thrilled that she's going to join and um, talk to us today about her views. She's a student um, working uh, with, she's a student with Hello Future, with educational nonprofits working towards transforming the refugee experience. And um, yeah, we're uh, we're excited to hear what she's got to say. Okay. Um, at the first, hi guys. Um, so John Lewis wrote before he passed away a few weeks ago um, that when historians pick up their pens to write the story at, of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burden of hate, alas, and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. I'm Hewa, 17 years old. Um, I, I'm from Syria. I live in, the, I born in Damascus as a Kurd. Um, I stayed there until third grade. Um, and then I moved on to um, Kurdistan in Sleimania. Um, I've been in urban refugee camp since 2015. So um, I'm going to talk about the stereotype. Um, despite of stereotype, what people thinking of refugees that um, there is like uh, I mean, it's, it's not the way that they're thinking of refugees um, as they are ignorant or um, hopeless or homeless. Um, as a refugee and Kurdish, I had um, a lot of struggles um, and a lot of people that bullied me. So um, when I was in Damascus, I didn't have the right um, to be the first in class. So even today, I was working so hard. Um, so I was the second always um, until we moved on. Um, and also in Damascus, uh, like generally in Syria, um, as a Kurd, um, the president um, denied our identity. And like he make us Arabs also. Um, just like um, to hide the fact that Kurt exists. Um, so, um, and as a refugee, when I moved on to Sleimania, um, people were kind of looking at us in a pity way. Um, they were calling us Arab, even though that um, we were talking about Kurdish. Um, even my sister, um, she got beaten by a girl once um, that she was bigger than us. Um, those all happened because of the stereotype. Um, even though that we are all refugees, but it, like we all like we we're not the same. Um, so this is not the reality. Um, I came from the reality, 
So uh, I'm an almost teenager. Um, like I, I had my own struggle. Um, I love space. I dream working at NASA. I'm also thinking of studying medicine. Um, I love traveling. That's why I went. Um, um, I like, like I care about my future a lot. Um, I want to make a change in the world. Um, one of the most successful people in the world. So, being other as a Kurdish or a refugee are just um, two stereotypes and experience that, like, of million stereotypes that people experience in the world. Um, I think that the dangers of single story that it make the one story became the only story. Um, and the single story create the stereotype. Um, what it, like the problem about the stereotype is like it's not that they are untrue, it's because that they're incomplete. Um, during uh, my school years in Arba refugee camp, um, I, I was chosen for a summer school scholarship to Japan by an organization. Um, I think that this experience made me the person who I am today, uh, made me confident and open-minded person, how to speak out, how to communicate with people easily, um, and also thinking in a positive way, because I was a shy person. I have trouble talking with people and communicate with them easily. Um, I started to learn um, leadership and also how to be a more creative person. Um, so um, thinking about all of that, um, I think that that country, Japan, is like, I learned a lot from it and from people who have struggled this single story, uh, minders uh, that make people see each other in a different way. Um, and it affects millions who are victim to the violence like um, Hiroshima bombing, and also all the violence and wars happening around the world. Um, why do people dehumanize each other, whether African women or a refugee? Um, I think it's also because of the single story. So um, it robs people from dignity, and it makes people recognition to our equal humanity. Um, difficult it empathizes how much we are different rather than how much we are similar to each other um if you want to live in a world that is full of empathy considerate love and that in a world that is free from single story i think we need to start uh from the simplest thing which we need to start um from empathy and listening Thank you for listening. Thank you, um, Hua. Thank you for your um, contribution and your reflections um, on why we, what happens when we dehumanize and why we should look for a different story. Um, that was really great. Our um, next speaker is Xavier Laka, who is an officer for the Stop the War Coalition in the UK and an activist with the People's Assembly Against Austerity and editor of counterfire.org. Um, so we will now hear from him. Hey, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Emma, and thanks to the team for organizing this really, really great event, and thanks to the other panelists who've spoken so well so far. Um, before I start, I just wanted to pay tribute to the victims of, of the bombing in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and also to pay homage to the huge numbers of activists who have campaigned against nuclear weapons and have campaigned against nuclear weapons since. Um, and I think that's quite pertinent to the discussion that we're having um, today. 
Um, the first thing I wanted to to talk about was about state violence itself, and you know what it is um, and how it how it works. Um, and I think it's important to start by saying that the state exists to maintain the interests of the capitalist system, um, and racism and other forms of oppression are deeply embedded within it um, and its structures because of its inherent need to exploit working people and to divide the opposition uh, against it uh, and the police are a prime example of this the police are an institution whose primary purpose is to defend the interests of the state um, and with the express authority to use violence to do that <clears throat> we've seen of course the multitude of uh, of black people killed by the police in the united states um, and it's because the police replicate this racism of the state um, one of the popular chants that um, has come out in the, in the Black Lives Matter protests in the US has been to shout at the police, who do you protect? Um, and I think this is an expression of the growing consciousness about the actual role that the police play in our society. Um, in the UK, uh, where I'm based, um, you know, while the, the police are not armed to the same level as they are uh, in the United States, we see the very same racism uh, embedded within them. Um, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police in London recently revealed that during the lockdown period uh, in the last three months, uh, they have stopped and searched over 20,000 uh, young black people um, in the space of this time. And that's equivalent to about a quarter of all young black people in the entire city. Um, there is a, very clearly an active and institutional approach uh, of racial profiling uh, and targeting black and brown people. And the second thing I want to say uh, on this about uh, state violence is that it is intrinsically linked to foreign policy, uh, to the wars that our countries perpetrate abroad. Um, in the United States, uh, the 1033 program has been used to transfer billions of dollars uh, of surplus military equipment to the police. Uh, and there are shared practices between the military and the police and within uh, and between uh, militaries and security services of allied uh, countries. For example, uh, the knee on neck tactic, which was used by the Minneapolis police uh, when they killed George Floyd, um, is a tactic that has been used here in the UK and is used uh, in other parts of Europe um, and is used, for example, by the Israeli military and police against Palestinians. Um, and there are shared uh, trainings between these forces um, and, you know, that's not to say that the U.S. police learned this tactic uh, from Israel, but there is a connected uh, commonality. Um, and it's this logic of militarism um, and the dehumanization of people uh, used to justify imperialist exploits that is a driver uh, of state violence at home. Um, the federal troops that Trump sent to Portland, Chicago and other cities to attack protesters uh, included ICE and Border Patrol agents that have been funded, equipped and trained to attack refugees uh, at the border. Um, the French riot police that brutally attacked the Gilets Jaunes and other protesters uh, are the same who have been tearing down refugee camps in Calais uh, and uh, tear gassing you know, vulnerable refugees and stealing their shoes and the like. Um, and across the West, the justification uh, for the war on terror in the last two decades uh, has relied on the demonization of Muslims in particular. Um, the setting up of counterterrorism operations specifically targeting uh, the Muslim community, uh, which in the UK, for example, uh, meant that in the first five years of the Prevent Agenda, uh, which is the, the UK's counterterrorism um, framework, 90% uh, of referrals to this uh, body were Muslims. Um, and we also see the attacks on Muslim women in particular across Europe, for example, with the banning of the niqab and the burkini, etc. Um, and I think these all feed into a wider um, framework of, of how the state perpetrates violence against people and, and targets minorities. Um, and the last quick thing I want to say about state violence is that it is also, of course, structural. Um, you know, the deliberate maintenance and exacerbation of inequalities in society, which do kill people, um, is violence. Um, you know, in the, in the UK, we've just found out in the last couple of days that the last 10 years uh, of austerity, which the government has implemented, has caused the deaths of over 250,000 people. Um, that's violence. Um, you know, the, the residents of Grenfell Tower who were left to burn um, 
because they were working class and, and ethnic minorities, that is state violence. So just to, to talk very quickly about civil disobedience as a tactic to be used against um, state violence, I think a fundamental thing that we have to acknowledge about state violence is that it is legal. Um, and that means that our resistance cannot commit to always acting within uh, the confines of the law, which is designed to protect them and not us. Um, and of course, it, you know, when such tactics are used, the state employs uh, its full apparatus, including the media, uh, to calling us violent uh, and, you know, using the police, for example, to respond to us in kind. Um, and there's that famous quote of, of Malcolm X in the 60s in the US where, where he was asked about the use of violence. And he said the only people who are asked to be non-violent in the United States are, are black people. Um, and that is, I think, a similar experience we have with our movements. Um, now, in the U.S. at the moment, with the with the Black Lives Matter protests, we've seen that uh, you know Trump and the media refer to them as rioters and looters. Um, in the U.K., we had Boris Johnson calling us thugs and extremists. Um, and we should be clear that you know the police who are brutally attacking the protesters, who in the United States have re resulted in dozens of people dying uh, in the protests. Um, a number of people have lost their eyes because they've been fired on directly by rubber bullets and tear gas canisters. canisters. Uh, you know, they are the rioters. They're the ones causing the violence. Um, and when, if they want to talk about looters, we can look at the fact that American billionaires in the last three months have made almost $500 billion, while over 50 million people have lost their jobs. Um, that is what I would call looting. Um, <clears throat> but of course, this, this justification, this characterizing of uh, our you know our movements against their violence as violence justifies the attacks um, on our protests and we've seen the absolutely barbaric attacks on for example the gilets jaunes in france uh, the protests against the g20 in hamburg uh, uh, the independence movement in catalonia uh, and so on um, but i do think that the tide is turning um, i think you know we when you look at public opinion uh, the Gilets Jaunes enjoyed majority support across France, um, as have the Black Lives Matter movement. And in fact, uh, over 57% of Americans supported uh, the burning down of the Minneapolis police station. Um, and in the UK, we had majority support for you know, bringing down the statue of, of a slave trader, Edward Colston, uh, which has sparked similar um, uh, uh, pulling down of statues across the world. Um, so I think that tide is turning, but I think one thing I'll say is that I think civil disobedience uh, has to be one tactic uh, that is part of building a mass movement um, that aims to bring the widest number of people together in collective action. Um, I think disruption is really important, but our strength uh, is in our numbers and our ability to organize. Um, so in the United States, for example, um, you know, nothing has scared the establishment more than the size of the protest, the fact that they've had historic numbers of, uh, of white people um, joining the protest, the fact that in places like Portland, the front line of defense against, uh, you know, the federal troops have been lines of, of mums and veterans. Um, and, you know, we've seen nurses leaving 12 hour shifts to come and treat injured protesters. Um, and that's the kind of movement we should be uh, aiming to build uh, and that we need uh, if, if we are to, to tackle the state and its violence um, and also to try and attempt to, to generalize that into you know other campaigns and, and into trade union activity as well so I'll end in just saying that I think we need to work nationally and internationally to build uh, the biggest possible uh, coalitions uh, to take on the state uh, thank you Thank you, Sharia, um, for your reflections and tying it into the larger movement. Um, our final speaker, I think, has been having some tech issues, but she has just rejoined us, so hopefully that will be, um, it'll hold out for the, for the remainder. Um, so our final speaker is Reverend Carleen Griffith-Seckel. Um, she's uh, got a CV as long as my arm and has done amazing things amongst them, um, is a speaker, preacher, theologian, cultural worker and community organiser. She's worked on human rights, decolonization, and anti-colonial cultural regeneration, on HIV and AIDS prevention, community youth engagement. She's a founder and principal 
of the Dignity Project International, which is an organization committed to the creation of internal and external cultures of justice and equity, um, and is a lead organizer with the Boston Black Lives Matter movement, as well as involved in the International Black Lives Matter movement. So we're um, very excited to have her as our final speaker for today. Um, and we hope that the internet holds up. Hi, thank you so much. Um, really thankful uh, to be here. And um, I think what I, I want to zero in on um, uh, the topic of civil disobedience against state-sanctioned violence and police brutality um, from the perspective of the movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter um, in the United States. They, uh, since the killing of George Floyd, um, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, we have seen a massive insurgents um, and uprising within the United States, um, seeking justice for uh, the unmitigated um, abuse of, of power and violence um, against uh, Black communities that have uh, uh, the historical um, lens uh, the long durée of historical injustices for for people of African descent. Um, are you all hearing me okay? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. My um, uh, screen is doing strange things. Um, so, um, it's important to note that the current moment um, is just, of course, the most recent um, show of the ongoing struggle for um, um, shifting the ways in which um, state imperial power and violence of the state is mitigated upon um, indigenous folk and black folk within the United States and of course tied to a larger uh, mechanism of violences throughout the world. And this moment presents an opportunity for Black Lives Matter in particular to continue to push um, for a shift in that mechanism of uh, a shift in that power. Um, one of our central calls that have ar arisen uh, beginning with Minnesota um, and has rippled throughout is to defund the police. Um, and we see that once we focus on shifting the resources that are galvanized for um, oppressing our communities, particularly Black communities who are hyper-surveilled, um, hyper-arrested, um, and, and disproportionately murdered, um, through police violence and vigilante and um, uh, murderers and, and security guards within community, as we saw with Ahmad, Ahmad Arbery. Um, those resources can then be um, reverted to support the actual lives of communities through education, through providing funds for health care. Um, and it points us to the interlocking ways in which both aggressive and direct violence against our communities um, uh, uh, extract resources, but also we are addressing soft violences, right? Which, you know, I'm not so sure that term is appropriate um, to say that inadequate housing and access to health care, um, access to 
uh, education and, and the mechanisms for flourishing in Black communities um, are, are violence, right? And um, we see that within a pandemic that the pre-existing pandemic has been white supremacy and racism. And at the root of all of these are our state, our, our, our state mechanisms that have never worked for people of African descent and have really not worked for indigenous folk and have fed into the broader superstructures um, or our tentacles rather of the broader superstructures that we fight against when we talk about um, ending uh, the mechanisms of war or, or stopping nuclear proliferation. Um, these in interlocking violences are at the heart and the core of what this current movement and uprising and insurgents um, on the part of the Black Lives Matter movement to make legible and to put a stop to. There is a unique opportunity in this moment um, to uh, really fight for on a um, really global level um, when, we, when it comes to human rights because people saw uh, firsthand with um, the police officer who kept his leg on the neck of George Floyd for over eight minutes. Um, that is not new to Black communities um, who have been experiencing these kinds of um, dehumanization. However, the world saw that our cry um, uh, from uh, Emmett Till to uh, Medgar Evers to Sandra Bland um, and all of the litany of others to Mike Brown, Corinne Gaines and so many others are not, um, they, they, they are not distorted, but they are very real. So this moment has been recalibrating um, the lens of reality um, so that there becomes more of a mutually shared or a broadly understood reality that our cry for Black Lives Matter is simply to say that Black lives do matter because they have not. And these are the ways in which we have, we are able to archive and document that they have not for a uh, police officer, officer to stand casually and snuff the life out of another human being, um, perhaps thought to be uh, non-human um, material in his eyes, is, is, is the representation of systemic and state and structural um, implements of white supremacy, of uh, state-sponsored violence. And so the world, has, the world has an opportunity to see. Um, and what has been happening is that more and more people are joining and are, have awakened to not just affirming that Black Lives Matter, but also joining movements um, our movement in the street from Minnesota to Kentucky to Portland. Um, in this moment, we also see these emblems and, and symbols um, uh, that reflect an alternative narrative to that which we've been speaking about. Again, many of which are state-sponsored in terms of national and historical heroes that are emblazoned in, 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 as trophies, as monuments. Um, uh, symbolic violence um, are being torn down, they're being dismantled. Um, and so uh, this moment presents this opportunity for uh, a broader segment of demos to, of, of the people, right, of, um, to rise up and to, um, um, and to resist and to call for systemic and policy changes. Um, and, and to really imagine and dream of a world um, yeah, that, 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 that really presents true democratic values. And so you, Black Lives Matter um, 
is uh, entrenched um, in the political arena, um, is entrenched in shifting the narratives and the possibilities. Now we're seeing more um, in electoral politics that you know, Cori Bush, who is a Black Lives Matter activist, got elected um, in St. Louis, um, which four, five, six years ago would not have been possible. We have basically been seen as terrorists and agitators, um, but now more people on the national and international scale are able to resonate, are able to see, and are willing to join our movement. And so, Civil disobedience um, is more critical now and has an opportunity um, to flourish and to push these edges, right? Our, our um, liberation is not tied to electoral politics solely, um, yet it is rendering a space that conversations about reparations, right? Conversations about um, the inequities, black women and, and immigrant women and um, uh, uh, essential workers are largely, um, are largely make up essential workers, uh, low wage um, workers are the folk who are keeping um, our health systems and our care networks and our services um, running and a call to really revisit the way in which the state responds and as we've seen the 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 buffoonery and the fiasco in terms of what you know our our uh, occupant in the white house um, is responding is just insufficient um and appalling but the coordination of 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 movements to shift the very structure the very fabric of this um uh experiment in democracy is the moment that we're currently living in so while it is dark and while it is difficult we find that it is a great opportunity we find that the power of the people is is real we find that people are willing to have conversations and make movements towards reparations towards defunding um the police uh, and to reimagine a system where communities uh, create and imagine their own mechanisms of, of, of community care and community protection. It is no longer seen to be um, unrealistic or unachievable. Um, so while I've, 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 I'm highlighting um, the terror uh, that have been wrought for over 400 years upon black lives that have been wrought upon indigenous peoples um, uh, within the united states and the broader um, interlocking imp imp for, uh, imperialist forces of capitalism of, of, of heteropatriarchy and warmongering um, across um, across the world um, it is a promising and hopeful moment where we are seeing in the movement for Black Lives that our solidarity is um, much more prescient now in the Palestinian liberation struggle. We have been doing work with the Dalit people, with um, the Roma people who have or are being scapegoated. Um, and as fascism continues to rise, the movement of the people all across the world um, continue to rise and salute to our, our comrades here who are representing these communities um, and across the globe um, that we will continue the struggle and we will continue to res resist through civil disobedience um, and through disruption and insertion um, of a grander and larger imagination where um, 
every human life and every people um, who have been dehumanized and who continue to suffer under these oppressive forces are liberated. And we realize and know that each of our struggle is not um, in silo, but they are linked and they are, they're, they're tied and necessary. Um, we are not free until uh, all others are free and all others are not free until uh, black lives are also free. So thank you all for this time. Thank you. Um, I, could, I think I could listen to all of you for, for much longer. Um, but we've got some excellent questions coming in and I, I have a couple of my own. Um, just to reiterate our thanks to all of you for, for raising um, such varied and interesting responses to the topic. Um, Agnelli brought in the problems of class and the impact of, of that on, the, on, on people's experience of the pandemic and also climate and, and the issues in Brazil around protection of the Amazon and the Bolsonaro government and complicity with paramilitary groups. Um, who are bringing in the ideas of narratives and stories and how we other people in order to maintain narratives that are unhelpful and unconstructive. Shabir then helpfully building on that talking about structures of uh, racism and policies that maintain a capitalist system um, and the the violence that goes into protecting that and I, I wanted to take a very brief moment there to to, to mention that obviously um, Shavir talked about Shavir talked about structural violence and the violence of that and I think um, we've had the one of the uh, most startling examples of that in the last couple of days with the explosion in Beirut which was a function not of active violence by the state but of the violence wrought by inactivity of the state as well and I just wanted to take a moment to reflect on the many people who have suffered and died as a result of that in a very obvious display of that usually more nebulously caught concept. Um, and then Kylie rounding us off uh, talking excellently about um, Black Lives Matter and, and the wider moment that we're in and um, I was really struck by one of the things that's sort of part of the system of, of the use of language when you talked about an insurgence and you used about, talked about being referred to as terrorists and agitators and how these words are used to invalidate and prevent and, and um, to invalidate struggle and to invalidate the peace movement and um, how that those words can also be um, reclaimed and, and put to different use as well. Um, some of them, I think there was very little case for the word terrorist. Um, so thank you so much to all of your contributions. Um, I, I wanted to, I'm, we're going to have a really great discussion I can already see from the, the questions and answers, but I, I thought we'd just take a brief moment, and Carleen, you did touch on this, um, uh, of just to ask you all, um, we're hearing so many bad news, 2020 just feels like a, a run of one crisis after another. Um, but where, where do you, each of you see um, opportunities for hope and um, looking forward? Um, someone wants to jump in, should I nominate? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, I, I spoke last, so I'm happy to give others an opportunity to, to jump in. Um, but you know in 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 our tradition hope stands side by side with the darkness right um and so but in this particular moment there is hope in that as i as i spoke as i said that more and more people are awakening there has been um a lot of politicization of, of young people. We have protests here. I'm, I'm in, in the Boston area. I live in Cambridge um, and organized with Black Lives Matter Boston. But there are more and more um, groups that are organizing and, and not just organizing and protesting, but mobilizing um, communities to be involved 
um, in, 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 this, uh, in this moment, right? In, in transport and changing the status quo. Um, I recently did an interview from a uh, port city in Newburyport here in um, Massachusetts, which is largely a white um, affluent uh, port city. Um, and uh, there, there were questions for this community about the uh, validation of uh, marching for Black Lives Matter as white folk um, in their own community. And I think that's a shift. Um, people are more now willing to take on the responsibility of um, doing anti-racism work, right? Um, of disrupting, using their own power within communities. It's also a great opportunity for inter uh, for cross movement solidarities for international uh, movement building and figuring out what what solidarity means and what it looks like it is a a beautiful moment to strengthen intergenerational uh, linkages um, we experienced the passing of one of our uh, great leaders um, John Lewis as an elder, and many of us who are subsequent generations recognize an opportunity to learn. Um, and not that we have always been or, or are in a full agreement with all of the ideological or political positions, but we recognize that we are indebted um, to the struggles of those who came before, to our ancestors, that is a value and a deep uh, sacred um, belief in, in our movement. And so we honor our ancestors and their commitment in, 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 in our struggle. And um, so intergenerational movements and uh, the leadership of younger generations, the ideas, um, it is tremendous. And um, I am going to stop. I could say a lot, but that particular last uh, point um, is the wisdom, the brilliance, the genius of those generations who uh, follow, right? Um, uh, and capacity to imagine and visualize, but also bring to bear real material force resources, time, energy, capacities with technology um, to be all in and to form a kind of community rooted in deep love, um, deep solidarity and care um, for one another. Our, our principled is what we call principled struggle. And I must say that I am heartened by that um, among other things. Thank you, Carly, and, and maybe on that note, um, we can pass over to Hewa um, as, the, as the youngest member of our panel and uh, one of these very inspiring young people working um, today. Yeah, so uh, as you said, Emma, um, 2020 was full of bad news and it really affects people um, because of coronavirus. Um, school um, was, was closed. Um, as like a lot of students couldn't do the final exam um, and also like, we couldn't see um, our relatives or friends and it really affected us um, and also George Floyd murder so it, it was really a big thing like it like it hurt a lot um, and also a few days ago um, the bomb in Beirut so I know it's all bad things, but I, I think that um, we have to be hopeful because um, nothing came from the, like, if you think in a negative way, so in, especially in that period, you have to think in a positive way and, like, we have to work on ourselves that we can be taught to, to make a change and, like, like to, to give, like, a better life to people. And just help them, like, I, to make them also think in a positive way. Because, yeah, I heard like a lot of my friends actually, they always like sending me messages that, oh my God, we're really depressed because 
thing, not going um, outside their home. So, yeah, and hearing a lot of that was such bad news, but we don't have to think of it in a bad way. So, yeah, we have to be hopeful and patient. Thank you. Um, Shabir? Um, yeah, I mean, just, just to, to add to, to what's already been said, I mean, I think the, the politicization of people particularly is, is what gives me the most hope. I mean, I think we've seen some of that in the kind of uh, Bernie Sanders in the US and Jeremy Corbyn in the UK moments um, and similar expressions across, across Europe and the world. Uh, but particularly in the, in the last uh, year, the, the two kind of manifestations of one, the school strikes for climate and to the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, really show this this mass willingness of people to, you know, question what they're being told and, and to want to create a better society and not only to want to do that, but to actively, you know, get out on the streets and work collectively to try and do that. Um, and I think that's that's been really helpful and particularly with, with Black Lives Matter here in Britain, we've had protests in over 200 towns and, and cities in the UK. And some of the biggest protests outside of the main cities were in the kind of uh, what have been called the Brexit heartlands and, you know, the very working class white areas, uh, you know, which is which is incredibly um, inspiring. And just the second thing to say is that I think during this coronavirus pandemic, we've seen real uh, people to people solidarity. I think in uh, particularly in Britain, in every single community uh, and locality in the country there's been kind of mutual aid groups that have been set up uh, and people supporting each other where our government has very clearly failed people uh, people are stepping up to the plate and i think that's that's been really helpful thank you and Agnelli. well um hope makers move forward uh, hope is the is our food. Hope is our uh, is hope is is in our soul. Uh, we are for centuries. We are resisting, and we should move on. And uh, it's especially uh, in this moment where we see different movements all over the world. We we see these on TV. We see these movements on social media. And we, it's a good opportunity to, to tell people that democracy is not only go and vote. Democracy is the right to be organized in your union, in uh, NGO, any social movement. So this is democracy. Democracy is the capability to change the, the rules, to change the way things are going. And uh, I think in this scenario, uh, in this pandemic scenario, we see that people are more aware uh, and people, for example, in favelas, people in favelas are organizing themselves in solidarity. They are um, getting funds. They are getting uh, funds to distribute food cleaning this infection operation by themselves. So um, this, this community spirit is very important uh, to change uh, the reality. Uh, for example, other example, we had this last Saturday, we had um, a huge online assembly with professors and teachers in Rio de Janeiro because the major wants to reopen schools and university. So, uh, it's something uh, that we, we've never seen something before. Uh, 600 people are engaged to go on a strike against this, this situation. We, can, we cannot go back to school at this time. So we feel that cooperation, solidarity, and uh, this willing to organize themselves is something that, it, in my point of view, it's something that it's um, surreal right now. So uh, I'm a very hopeful uh, person and I believe that we can change the world. Yes. Thank you.
um, it's great to hear so many different reflections on, on where to be hopeful and I think I, I do agree that there's a lot to find difficult at the moment but also I think this is an amazing moment to be living through and seeing what people are doing with it um, in terms of solidarity and action. I, uh, I had one more question I wanted to ask. I think what we'll do now is we'll sort of, I'll ask questions and people can jump in if they want to, but we don't, everyone doesn't have to answer if they if they don't feel uh, like um, they have something to add. So um, the next one is is this sort of idea we've talked about nonviolence and uh, that comes up a lot in the peace movement and then civil disobedience. And um, often we find that, uh, the, the destruction of property and destruction of statues is, is viewed as, as violence akin to attacks on people and how and, and thus delegitimizes a protest or delegitimizes a movement um, from people seeking to detract from that movement. I was wondering if any of you had any reflections on where that, um, and I, this may be an obvious question, but on where the line is for you, where do we, where do we draw the line in terms of um, Nonviolence and uh, and civil disobedience. Uh, I mean, I can. Does this? Does um, anyone want to jump in on that, or shall I go through the group? Should I jump in very quickly? Um, I mean, I just, I, I want to say, I, you know, this is an argument we've particularly been hearing in the last couple of months around um, stuff that's happened at Black Lives Matter protests. And I think we should be clear that property damage is not violence. Um, you know, when, when a statue is brought down, when uh, the police station of the police who have been out killing people <laughs> is burned down, that's, that's not violence and we shouldn't be um condemning it I, I i think equally we we shouldn't necessarily be putting that as the, the main tactic we're trying to achieve or front and center of our movement we shouldn't be going out trying to do these things uh but where they happen you know, I, I think it's a legitimate expression of of anger and opposition and um i i, I think we have to defend people like it, you know the statue that was brought down uh, in bristol of edward colston the police have uh, arrested someone on on those grounds um, and I think we have to defend that person and say that was, you know, completely uh, acceptable thing to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think our power, like I said, is is in our in our numbers and in our ability to organize. So um, that's what we should be aiming to to do. And you know, if if things happen, we should uh, defend people. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, to add to that, I, I'm always struck that um, a nonviolence comes up as a retort um, to Black Lives Matter, um, that violence in Black Lives Matter seems to be um, cast, is, is casted um, in the dominant narrative in the, in the media. And um, you know, we the, the the movement is not a purveyor of uh, of of violence. Um, we are actually resisting violence. The resistance uh, of the violence of dehumanization, of of genocide, of injustice, of not according sacred worth and dignity to Black lives, to Indigenous lives, and the violence of not. Um, providing adequate um, resources and support. So we, um, net, we cast this narrative to silence and to erase um, what's at heart, right? Poverty is violence, right? To create conditions of inequity, of dehumanization, of genocide, um, uh, of, of occupation of police and terrorization in our communities is violence. Um, and we are there to, to stand against that. 
And so um, civil disobedience is just that. It is a right that is accorded to us. It is a human right, actually. Um, and it is also constitutionally accorded to us. And so, um, d you know, often, and yes, their property destruction is not, um, is, is a red herring in, 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 this, in this context. Um, this is a part of the the dog whistle of uh, American of the unit of the history of the United States. Black peoples were property. Black peoples were enslaved to build and maintain and um, and and monetize uh, property over and against their own human worth and values and lives. And so, yeah, I, um, I think we, we must be critical when we have conversations and create a duality with civil disobedience and, and violence. Um, intrinsically, our civil disobedience is, is one that fights against violence. Um, and by every means necessary, we aim to make legible the human uh, worth and dignity of Black lives and, and, and therefore all other lives. Yeah, I also want to add something. So um, I think that um, civil, this Disobedience is one of the ways that people have revolted against unfair laws and has been numerous documented peaceful resistance movements. Um, and I think that it's absolutely not violent. Um, so in India, like they made this civil disobedience and they succeed. They made India an independent country. And also in, in, in like the Germans succeeded um overthrowing the 1920 and also i think that the french also succeeded in that so i think that it's not a violence um i would like to say something okay ah okay um well i would like to 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 talk a little bit about it, uh, I think this um, our our um, civil disobedience um, it's it's a, a human right, and uh, but but uh, the use of violence must be a part of a a, a strategy. Why do I say that? Because in 2013, during that journeys, demonstrations, huge demonstrations here in Brazil, in many states, uh, some groups were more, um, were using uh, violence to attack some symbols, just like banks, uh, system symbols. And so after that, the only person who was arrested was a black guy. He was arrested, accused, to be part of a terrorist group. So if we don't think in this um, violence uh, against properties of, uh, uh, as, a, as part of, a, of a, uh, a larger strategy, a bigger strategy, these actions wouldn't be so effective to talk to, to the population, to give another narrative of what's a real um, violence. We live violence daily. We live violence uh, in many generations. But if, if we don't think in a strategic way, this uh, violence against property would be something that uh, split um, our movement. And this is something that I would like to say, because here in Brazil, we have something like a, a three or six main groups that domain media in Brazil. So sometimes they say, oh, it's very beautiful, these demonstrations in the United States. It's very beautiful, this is what's happening in France. But when it happens in Brazil, they are always against us. Thank you all for your, your reflections on that. Um, 
and the question of violence and the difference between that and civil disobedience and as a right like this is um uh, i think an important conversation that's been coming up recently and as you say it's a sort of the whistle way of delegitimizing um which should be resisted as a narrative um we've got a number of excellent questions coming in through the q a um a couple ask about how um how uh there's been sort of talk about movements working together and forming coalitions for change um black lives matter and women's movements and climate change activists and um and Agnelli, you spoke a little about this uh, for um, in terms of sort of the need for the action on so many different fronts in uh, in um, in Brazil. So I just sort of wanted to ask um, how how we can better bring movements together in solidarity, how we can build those international coalitions of change um, that will make these movements um, really really successful. Is it a question for me? Uh, I think it's for everyone, but if you want to kick us off, uh, that would be great. <laughs> oh, um, I believe that we, we have uh, 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 the opportunity to use these new technologies to spread our voices and to articulate ourselves. Uh, I believe that we should have um, these kind of meetings, international meetings, uh, not only with uh, not only with activists but also with uh, academics uh, with uh, um, I mean um, artists uh, um, I mean we, we, we have to, to think how to, to improve this these um, this articulation and uh, not only South America but also in Europe and all over the world because um, we have different paths in our histories. For example, Brazil, we didn't have apartheid like in the United States, like in uh, South Africa. This, the racism as, uh, as a movement, it's, it's not so common. I mean, uh, uh, Brazil, since we were a child, we, we, we thought that we were a racial democracy because we live together, uh, we have multiracial couples, uh, everything was okay. We, we, so uh, it's, uh, an, it's a movement, the black movement in Brazil, it's different from other countries, but we must share information, must be more united to, to, to dialogue more about um, strategies to spread our ideas. Oh. Can I jump in quickly? Hello. Somebody else. Sorry. Uh, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think um, our movements need to, to help connect the dots for people, basically, and, and try and act in as much solidarity with each other as possible. So, um, and, and ultimately, obviously, our causes are interlinked. So with the, with the Stop the War Coalition, for example, if there is a... A protest against uh, austerity uh, you know stop the war makes sh make sure that we organize uh, as many of, of uh, you know our members and, and activists around us to be on that demonstration and have uh, banners and slogans like you know cut war not welfare or not healthcare etc so that people start understanding that you know they're there to oppose austerity but we are spending X amount of money on bombing Syria for example you know, why is that not being used on our NHS, etc. Um, so I think connecting those dots, and, and that's the way the movements can can really um, help bring people, you know, uh, across causes. Um, I think there is always scope for kind of uh, united uh, activity. Um, I mean, uh, Stop the War and the People's Assembly have helped to, to be part of, you know, conferences and demonstrations and, and public meetings. Uh, which you know bring together the cases um, for all different things and, and how they're connected, um, and I think this can work internationally as well. I mean, I, f I feel like we're probably on the on the low end of kind of this kind of international activity, but uh, you know, Europe, for example, has a great tradition of of people traveling across countries for for protests and to support things. 
Um, and I think the Black Lives Matter movement has shown how even if we're not necessarily going to each other's countries, we can work in tandem with each other and, you know, learn from each other's tactics and share the same message uh, wherever we are. Yeah, um, I think for us, our, you know, because we have become um, more and more becoming a um, borderless <laughs> is, is, is the way I'd like to, I like to put it. We have chapters um, or affiliated chapters in different countries. There's one in Japan and uh, the UK and Canada. Um, and, you know, so these movements locally have generated um, a lot of, of uh, cross movement solidarities right at locally. Um, and for us in the United States, many of our chapters work intentionally, Boston being one of them, of um, building relationship uh, with uh, uh, movements that are um, that are diasporic or that are that are transnational, um, and that sets the stage for uh, supporting and interlocking with each other on, on a more national stage. And that has been more and more what has been happening. Um, I think political alignment um, becomes important, second to uh, relationship and uh, political education, understanding, you know, the history of the Roma people and, and how um, that dynamic across Europe uh, impacts the Roma people, right? And once we understand that and make legible the, the, the particularity of that struggle, you know, I as a, or we as a Black Lives Matter movement, but I as a person, as leader in Black Lives Matter, um, then it's much more easy to find um, a common humanity, right? To find compassion and empathy and to link our struggles um, as the, 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 the a movement for, for all Black lives, um, to find resonance uh, with other communities who are also engaged in the same struggle, to find dignity and um, to obtain human rights and civil rights um, that should be accorded. And so I think it's multi-layered, but certainly I know for us, a lot of it does begin local. We are a cosmopolitan, you know, um, city and region and, and, and in the United States, there are people from all over the world. Um, and certainly the internet connects us. Um, but yeah, relationship building is key to that and then understanding um, each other's struggle with, for what they are. Um. Um, thank you uh, so much to all of those. Um, great uh, all of your great reflections and and thoughts on these questions we're coming to the end of the um, the, the webinar now um, and I know there are questions that haven't been answered I'm, I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all of them but I hope this has been a uh, useful and interesting discussion for everyone participating um, I know I've learned a lot and um, I've, I've really enjoyed it so uh, I just wanted to ask if if you had sort of one final thing uh, you wanted to say, e each of you, and then um, I think we're going to try and take a group photo um, on Zoom. Uh, and um, and and yeah, but if we could if we could wrap up with a sort of final uh, comment or message or uh, anything you'd you'd like to share, um, and then we'll we'll do the photo, which uh, I think Emily will take us through. Um, let's should we do it in the same order as the the speaking again? So maybe Agnelli, you could you could start us off finishing off. Well, uh, I think we should be more connected. Uh, it's always a, a great pleasure to be to and 
to be here talking with people all over the world uh, with uh, uh, their experience, sharing their experience, sh sharing what's going on in their, in their, in their countries. Uh, it's always an opportunity to renew our energy, to know that we are doing something and we are going to change the world. And uh, I do believe that we have to cross uh, the, the cause because we are thinking we are very worried about what's going on in in our environment uh this uh unequal de development in all every country we see the poverty is growing fast and fast and our lives our, our lives matter um our lives we should give humanity and dignity to everybody so uh, it's my final words. Thank you very much. And I hope we, we would keep in touch. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, I also said, um, and, and, and Yola, I think, I think that, um, like, it, it's great that the people can be aware and considerate about each other and learn more about each other that um, you can be like more open-minded and know how the people feel or um, what experience they went through that you can learn from them um, and also um, being connected to each other um, being nice and understand each other uh, to make a change in the world and thank you all I actually, it, it, like each time when I join a meeting like this, um, when I know like we're kind of making a change in the world, I actually like fe feel really proud. So thank you all. Thank you, Hewa. Um, Shavit. Yeah, just to, to echo thanks to, to everyone. Um, I think this has been a really informative meeting and I think this is a, a really good example of just how internationalism can work and how we can learn from each other and, and further our causes. Um, I think at this present moment with the, the kind of global coronavirus pandemic, uh, with the, the kind of developments that are happening, we are entering into a period of, of serious uh, unrest and serious crisis. And I think while that can be daunting, I think it is also a moment where we have everything to fight for and everything to win. Um, so we absolutely need to keep building our movements nationally and internationally uh, and keep uh, working to, to create a change and you know against war against racism and solidarity with oppressed people all over the world in Palestine and Kashmir and elsewhere um, and I hope we can have many many more meetings like this so thank you thank you and uh, Caroline um, so we have survived uh, apocalypse before um, and you know like the phoenix we remake ourselves we take the ashes we take the rubble we give thanks to the ancestors um, we lift up and encourage our young but it is a great moment and it is our moment to each and every one of us regardless of where we are in the world when we see it as our moment um, and that we are in this struggle together i believe uh what we say um normatively in our movement that we will win um, and so I am deeply grateful and honored to have connected with um, these comrades, these all of you on, on this platform. Um, and I look forward to our continued struggle together. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And um, once again, thanks to all of you for joining. And um, thank you to uh, my, my colleagues who we've all worked, um, who've all worked very hard to put together this webinar and uh, make sure it all works. And, um, and I really look forward to continuing the conversation uh, too. So um, thanks for that.